The next couple of slides giving you some different views of the skull, um, giving you some of the terms for these processes that you see. Okay, like I said, I'm going to stand up here and read them to you. Lateral view of the skull, one of my favorite, by the way, because we get to see, we get to see a lot of the processes. One of the things that's kind of interesting is how you want to think about the jaw into the cheekbone, okay, even though those are not the medical terms, you would want to refer to them in their medical terms, okay, but the connections amaze me, and in this area, we have some articular cartilage and some fibrocartilage that's present because I think I mentioned how much stress is placed on these bones when we actually chew. Now, in the actual palpation that could occur, because you know when you're dealing with the patient, you know, palpate means you're actually having the ability to touch, okay? These are areas that you would feel some of these processes and, you know, projections and so forth that are extending off of the skull and the facial bones. Ah, one that we're probably all familiar with, but I wonder if some of the stuff that we get to see, you know, like at Halloween time and everything, if it's as detailed, <laughs> you know. Um, in our models that we have, okay, it's going to be difficult to kind of identify some of these facial bones because what we're dealing with is plastic, okay so it's a little harder and that's why that case that I have in the uh, cabinet over there be sure to take a look at that so you can get a little closer view of each individual bone once again areas that would be able to be palpated on a patient the orbit of the eye and the bones that could make it up very fragile bones okay but believe it or not tough and when, you, when we get to studying the special senses, it's amazing the protection that our eye has. You know, even though, ooh, you know, y'all know how I like my walking dead, right? Okay, and so, been catching up on the season, because Sunday nights, but... <laughs> All right, and so, don't know if any of y'all watch it or not, but... One of the bad guys, okay, to the good guy, hit him in the back of the head with a baseball bat and made his eye pop out. And it was like, and y'all know me, what did I do? I rewound. <laughs> okay, so, and then, you know, everybody's like, oh, can that really happen? Yeah. Bones of the nasal cavity. Now, one of the things that I want to point out here, when we get into the special senses, these little flaps that we see here that are called the concha, what does that make you think about? A conch shell, okay? They kind of have a little flip like the conch <laughs> shell does, okay? We're going to come back to that. That's going to come back to us in part two when we talk about the special senses. Here are the bones that are going to make up the nasal cavity. And this one, definitely check the box for with the separate bones, okay? Because it's difficult to see on the skulls that we have. <clears throat> in these facial bones, in the skull area that we're going to find, we're going to find our sinuses. You know, I don't know about you guys, but it seems like this warmer weather kind of has made my sinuses act up. All right. And sinuses, what we're going to see is going to be this like huge hole, this huge open area that's involved within those bones. We name them for where the bones are found. So we have frontal sinuses, maxillary sinuses, ethmoidal and sphenoidal sinuses. 
When you begin to look at the area of the skull that's occupied by the brain, because you know, looking at this part right here, that skull itself doesn't look very problematic. It looks kind of smooth, you know, doesn't seem to have too many projections. <coughs> There's a few, okay? But for the most part, the bones look rather nice and smooth, okay? But open it up. Which thing? Okay, so when we open, and remember, this is the area that the brain tissue, okay, would be sitting in. Looks very mountainous, cratery, um, jagged, ridges, okay? It's allowing for the tissue to actually nest in these areas. Very important tissues. All right? <clears throat> Got a whole lot here for the cerebrum. Okay? A little bit back here for the cerebellum. But notice that when we get to the midbrain, pons, <clears throat> medulla oblongata, okay, we're sitting a lot of stuff into this area and it's very well protected by this bone. One <clears throat> of the areas, the cella tersica, looks just like a little indentation right there where my finger is. Look at what it houses. <coughs> Right there on the fingers. Okay. A little dip. Okay. A little dip. Note what it houses. Call the cell Have you heard of this one? What do you know about it? Master gland, maybe? Very important, to say the least. Of course, whenever you hear foramen, foramen means a big hole, okay? Well, hole, all right? The foramen magnum is letting us know a very huge hole. Okay, this is for the exit of the spinal cord so that it can begin to move down through the vertebrae. All right, so um, very important areas of the skull. That's sort of just the view that I kind of walked around with. Okay, the base of that cranial cavity. We see that there are a couple of foramens, a couple that are pretty important. Think about the jugular, the foramen. Gotta love like the occipital condyles, the styloid process. But anyway, these are things that you guys are going to be looking at because it's going to be on your list. The inferior view of the skull. Some of these you'll be needing to learn. And a li nice little list of our skull. Yeah, talking about the holes and the process, you know, more processes and so forth. Now, when we talk about bones of the skull, we've got the 22 plus six auditory ossicles, three in each ear, the middle ear bones. <clears throat> When we look at the areas for the skull, 
we have what's termed the brain case or the neurocranium, because neuro meaning nerve tissue, all right, because it houses the brain. We have the facial bones or the viscerocranium, which is going to be what we think of as our facial area. But they're saying viscero because what does viscera mean? Any idea? When you hear the term viscera, begin to automatically think about an organ. We're calling it viscera or viscero because of our sensory organs that are housed there. Eyes, nose, tongue. Getting into the special senses. Now for the next quite a few slides. It begins to take the bones piece by piece by piece. So, like I said, I'm not going to stand up here and read every single one of them to you, okay? Because you're going to be, you know, moving around in lab looking at them anyway. But note how many slides. Ha! Huh, finally, something new. The vertebral column. Now, for the vertebral column, yes, supports the weight of our head and our trunk. <clears throat> yes, protects the spinal cord. It allows spinal nerves to exit. What in the world does that mean? If I look at my vertebral column, okay, and my spinal cord, which is running through this these vertebr vertebrae, all right. I wish they wouldn't have cut them off, okay. I really do. I wish they would have left them, but the yellow is representing nerves that exit their vertebral column. These nerves would be doing this number. Does that make sense? So they cut them off, okay, but in real life they're innervating all the periphery from that spinal cord. Alright, so they exit the vertebral column. <laughs> gives us a site for muscle attachment, lets us have movement of the head and the neck. And that's going to be due to the first two vertebrae, C1 and C2. <clears throat> 26 bones in the adult, 33 to 34 in the embryo because we haven't had fusion yet of some of the bones, okay? So, five of them fuse to make the sacrum, four to five make the coccyx bone. The regions that exist, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, coccyx, okay? So those are the four regions that exist. 